Okay, can you see a screen and then can you see a map? I can see the map now. Okay, great. Basically, I'm going to be going between the two quite rapidly. So, okay, cool. Yeah. So, hi, my name is Anthony Wood. I'm a postdoc in Rolling KS Group at Frost Institute at the University of Edinburgh. And broadly speaking, what we've been working on is COVID from a Scottish perspective. So, modeling simulations in Scotland, looking at it at a spatial level. Okay, so to give a quick overview of Scotland, because geographically it is quite different to uh, like the rest of the UK in many ways. So it comprises around half, around like one tenth of the UK in terms of population. Of that population of five and a half million, three and a half million or so is concentrated amongst like one central belt. So that comprises Edinburgh, Glasgow, which is the largest city, Falkirk and like a few other smaller cities and towns. Outside of that, you've got Aberdeen, which is like quite a dense population center in Venice. But the central point is that otherwise Scotland is very sparsely populated. So you have lots of areas where very few people live. And each of these points on the map here represents around like 500 to 1,000 people. With regards to deprivation, it's the case for Scotland, it's the case for pretty much everywhere in the UK and probably the world, to be honest. You have very sharp differences between the most deprived areas and the least deprived areas with regards to just what they're like. But in terms of where they are, they're often very close to one another. So in, let's say, Edinburgh, for example, you have a very affluent area, which is often directly next door to a very deprived area. With regards to our COVID-19 data, so we get a slightly different uh, stream of data and we get asked from Public Health Scotland. And the important thing to note here is that this is given at the individual level. So for each individual vaccination or individual test results, so positive or negative, we get an age range within like a five year window. We know whether it's a male or female. And then most importantly, we also get their data zone. So a data zone is one of these points here and it groups it's basically like a census area and it bounds the population to pockets of 500 to 1000 individuals and scotland has of order 7000 of these data zones so with this large like high resolution data the question we want to address is why were the early cases in omicron where they were so looking at around like mid-November to around like the new year, why were the Hong Kong cases distributed again where they were? And they were distributed here. Looking at this on a map, I'll be careful to go fairly slowly. Broadly speaking, what we're looking at here is each circle represents a data zone. The size of the circle is the number of cases that were recorded. So this is Omicron specific cases that were recorded in that period and then the colour represents the cases per population so the red areas like the large red areas had lots of cases and lots of cases per person and at this level it's sort of what you would expect which is the highlands and islands and like the areas which are of very low density also had very few cases and this dense central belt had lots of cases and lots of cases per person but with that said, zooming into, so this is Glasgow here. Zooming into just taking Glasgow as an example, you do get variation within the area itself. And in particular, like the one counterintuitive thing is that in the densest, most central part of Glasgow, you actually get lots of areas that ran relatively cold, which isn't really consistent with other things that we'd expect. And just something I'll note at this point here is that the trends with regards to deprivation. So this is the Scottish IMD, which is basically the English one, but the Scottish data zone. So again, high resolution where red zones are more deprived areas and blue zones are less deprived areas. There isn't a remarkable spatial pattern, or at least I don't see one immediately. And that's worth bearing in mind as we go ahead. Okay, so we're trying to model this and in an ideal world, we'd have individual level behavior. We don't, but let's think about that anyway. So what affects whether you actually register a positive test? 
So the first obvious one is your interaction. So the frequency of um, who they're with, the frequency of the people you're interacting with, interactions, and so on. The other obvious one is your level of immunity. So essentially, have you acquired any immunity for either a vaccination or a previous infection? And the more slightly nuanced one, which has links to deprivation, is your propensity to test. So that's if you're infected, does that manifest as a positive test result in the data? And this could be like, if you became infected, but were completely asymptomatic, then unless you catch it on a lateral flow, you probably wouldn't test positive. So that's fairly innocuous. If you could be bothered, so that could even be, if you could be bothered to take a test in the first place, or kind of like more subtly, if you could be bothered to like, if you tested positive on a lateral flow, did you report it or did you go and get a PCR? You may have still isolated, but did you actually report the positive test? And then the more, even more subtle one is consequences if somebody needs to isolate. So, I mean, I'm in a nice situation where if I was to test positive, it would be annoying, but I would be able to work from home with very few consequences. For other individuals, that isn't the case and that needs to be considered. We don't have any of this data at individual level. What we do have is obviously the aforementioned COVID data. So that's vaccination uptake at the individual level, testing data, including negatives at the individual level. And using that, we can go back and see who's tested positive before and are they testing positive again? We've also got obviously census data. So it's worth bearing in mind, this is from the 2011 census because our Scottish census was still due to COVID. And so it's slightly out of date, but it gives us rough ideas of population pyramids. So who lives where information on households. So let's say the mean number of people that live in a household in a given data zone around the area, and also a number of measures relating to deprivation. With the data on the right, can we explain variation in the Omicron distribution in that initial outbreak is what we're trying to answer. The way we're going to do this is using what's known as random forest methods. So I won't go into this into major detail, but broadly speaking, what we're going to do is present a model with a bunch of predictor variables, which we'll term X. So this is just a simple two dimensional version. And given like training the model with, let's say 40% of the data, make predictions of the outcomes associated with that. The benefit of this is that it's an unstructured fit. So we're not giving it an equation. So we're not saying all oh, case, cases go as one of a vaccine or something. We're just presenting it with all this data and asking it to make its own mind up. And the genius in these is more to do with the algorithms rather than the method itself. The method is very simple, but this is good because here we have a ton of predictors. We don't quite know how they all play together, like how they all interact with one another. A lot of them will be highly correlated random forests are very, good, are very good at dealing with that. Okay, so here what we have in terms of our predictors is some trivial ones like population, age, sex. We also have vaccination uptake, testing, urban and rural status, and then a bunch of predictors associated with deprivation. And then the, out, like the outcome of the output variable Y is going to be the number of Omicron cases for that particular like age, sex, data zone split, which would be like 10 to 40 people roughly. And we're looking at of order like, I think it was like around like one in 20 people or one in 40, I don't know. I think like one in 20 people test positive on average. Okay. So this zooming back out and removing deprivation is what the data looks like. When we do this kind of like, we'll describe it as like a kitchen sink approach where we throw all of these predictors in, the model reproduces this distribution here. So flicking between the two, the point I want to make is that it looks to capture the spatial variation. So importantly, I don't tell the model that a given data zone is in Aberdeen, for example. I just give associated things to do with that data zone. But without giving it spatial information, it does appear to reproduce it, which is good. 
And similarly, zooming into taking Glasgow again as an example, it's a little flatter than the data, which is probably a good thing, all things considered. But it does appear to capture some of the regional variation at this fine scale. So it does appear to have caught, to have latched onto something, let's say. Okay. The way we assess the goodness of fit of these models is in terms of the residual. So that's the difference between the predicted value and the actual value. And the sign of a good model here is to have no particular bias in those residuals. So these are the residuals and the size represents the, the magnitude of the residual. Pink residuals are ones where we've underpredicted the number of cases. Green ones are where we've overpredicted. And the main point I want to make here is that there's no remarkable spatial picture in terms of the residuals. We slightly un, like overpredict the number of cases in the Highlands and Islands. Zooming into Glasgow, for example. We slightly underpredict some places, slightly overpredict other places. But again, there's no remarkable spatial pattern there, which suggests we've captured most of that variation within the model, which is good. And zooming back out. This is done using all of those predictors of again age, sex, deprivation, vaccine uptake, testing. One question you could ask is was all of that explained through just one or two variables alone. And we can probe that by looking at the exact same model, but instead saying, okay, let's take age, for example, generate the same prediction, but only informed by age. When you do that, these are the residuals that you get. So what we're seeing here is massive spatial patterns within the residuals, which implies we haven't captured something. So when we're just using age, we massively overpredict the number of cases in the Highlands and Islands, massively underpredict the number of cases in Greater Glasgow, but again, massively overpredict within the most central areas of Glasgow and the most central areas of Edinburgh. So age obviously does come into play, but it doesn't explain anything with, with regards to space. You can play the same game and say, oh, let's just use vaccination uptake as a, as the only predictor and say okay i hypothesize that the cases are where they are because of vaccine uptake when you do that the model again just fails pretty miserably you get these massive spatial variations within the residuals which tells you that there's something else at play the last one we'll do is with regards to population density and here it does a little bit better but as soon as you get into areas where you do have some density, so say like here's Stornoway in the Hebrides, we're still massively over predicting the number of cases. So it also isn't just a density question. Okay. So what we've shown is that any single predictor model, so by giving it just one element, fails catastrophically at predicting where those cases were. So with like age, you estimate pretty, like you explain pretty much none of the variation. With density, you get around 40%, but it still isn't a great fit. When you combine all of these predictors in a random forest, you get to an R squared of around like 75%. But more importantly, you reproduce that spatial variation across Scotland and you don't overfit or underfit certain major regions. When you look at the individual level data and you see this everywhere, if you're younger, you, you were like far more likely to test positive, but it doesn't explain anything on a spatial level. The more important thing here is this is where cases were and we ask, did hospitalizations follow the same spatial trends? At the health board level, so that's kind of like split in Scotland into like, I think it's seven or eight health boards. Yes, it does. But this kind of goes to the key point, which is at the level of deprivation, no, it doesn't. So this here is a plot of deprivation on the left and what we see, well, cases on the left. And what we see is that there's a slight trend in terms of cases per person per deprivation decile, but there isn't a remarkable one. And also you have a peak of both the most deprived and the least deprived. 
deciles. But when you look at COVID-related hospitalizations in the same period, you get quite a stark difference where the least deprived areas were having of order a half to a third as many admissions as the most deprived areas, despite reporting relatively similar numbers of cases. And this is going to be like, there are going to be inherent health issues related to deprivation here. But the point I want to make is that the case hospitalization rate, which is sort of the ratio between the two will be dependent upon the inherent infection to hospitalization rate, but also the proportion of cases that actually get picked up. So the proportion of infections that actually get picked up. And probably the most stark picture is if I pop on the deprivation filter here. So again, red is the most deprived areas and blue are the least deprived areas. If we look at the spatial patterns of the rates of negative LFD reporting, so this is negative tests being voluntarily reported, you see what is a pretty massive spatial trend. And it follows very strongly with regards to deprivation where these less deprived areas, say like in this corridor in Glasgow and this corridor here, far more LFD negatives are being reported. And in these more deprived areas, very few are being reported. That's the case in Glasgow. If we just zoom over to Edinburgh, you also see in Edinburgh where you have this corridor of deprivation along here. You have like Pilton up in here, Leaf in here, where again, very few LFD negatives are being reported. And that suggests a deprivation factor is involved in rates of well positive test reporting at the end of the day. Okay. So just to finish up, um, oftentimes when people are talking about where cases are, it's often like a single thing that gets blamed to say like areas with low vaccine uptake or it's just in the students or it's just in the dense areas. What we've demonstrated here is that you need a combination of all of these to explain anything spatially. It isn't just to do with one factor. It's, it has to be a complex combination of them. Using a random forest model, so you can kind of like dig into these as much as you want, but the resultant underlying trends are always going to be complex. And in the same way as the previous two speakers, I can't really offer any answers here because things are so strongly correlated with one another, it's difficult to disentangle. But with that said, the one thing we have shown is that testing propensity may be dependent upon deprivation. And that goes into the evidence seen from negative LFD testing, which again can be taken as a proxy for voluntary testing overall. But also the fact that there are more severe consequences if somebody tests positive in a more deprived decile. And that has to be considered when thinking about these case to hospitalization rates. The nice thing about this is that this considers um, basically this very specific time period of the initial Omicron outbreak, but we have a lot of opportunity to go further. So here we've applied a random forest model for Omicron. You could take that and run counterfactual scenarios. So for example, run the same model, but assume that everyone is testing, like has the same testing behavior, for example. Other things we can do is look at like applying the same sort of model to explain variation in vaccination uptake, testing behavior itself, and probably more importantly, variation in severe COVID-19 outcomes. And that could be with respect to them alone or with respect to case to hospitalization rates. Okay, and that's me. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Anthony. Um perhaps so that I can better see questions if you could stop sharing your screen for yeah, a moment. Sure. Thank you. Um, while everyone's thinking, I was, I've was i been curious throughout about the pattern of LFD reporting, partly because earlier in 2021, and it changed sort of over time as more and more groups became priority groups for testing um, and started, were asked to do LFDs twice weekly. In the beginning of 2021, it was relatively select group of people who were working outside the home and then schools. And then it wasn't really until the end of 2021 during this period that you've been looking at that people were encouraged to like use LFDs before meeting up socially um, or before seeing, you know, 
vulnerable people more. And so I was curious whether you can see any change. Maybe this is a longer time frame than you've considered, but whether you could see any change in that um, stark relationship that you saw in the reporting of negative LFDs over time, over 2021, and whether this period you've looked at is, is quite different from earlier in the year. Yeah. So so most of the work I've been looking at is it, it's essentially certainly with the LFD negatives, it's focused on the Omicron period in particular. So Prior to that, I haven't looked at the data in much detail, but I have certainly looked at data since the initial Omicron outbreak. And the one thing you notice is that testing patterns to, in terms of like the number of tests being reported, that changes very like quite slowly over time. So for example, one thing we noticed was that as cases were going up recently, testing wasn't really responding as rapidly. So testing was staying pretty consistent, but then positivity was sleepwalking up because the number of positives was, were going up. So kind of like, if you would want to probe that, that you would probably look in terms of positivity rather than positives. But in terms of how it's changed over time, it's always stayed pretty consistent where the most deprived SRs have always had lower rates of negative LFD reporting. In terms of PCRs, the picture is a lot more flat, but I was taking negative LFDs as a proxy for how often are people just testing in a more volun like more voluntary, cautious manner. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Um, does anyone else have an have another question? We're going to have um, a coffee break in a few minutes, but if there are any questions. Um... Yeah, Liz, there's a, I think a couple of things were posted in the chat. I'll just read them out quickly. It, in, they may have been partly addressed. One is from Matt. Is rate of negative reporting correlated enough with propensity to test? The other one is from Peter. Um, uh, do you have a sense of how important it was to have data at the DZ level of spatial granularity? So I guess if there isn't time to answer that now, maybe it could be answered in chat. But anyway, hand over to you. I think we I think we have a few minutes now. Um... Yeah, I, I can go over it. So the first one is, um, is rates of negative reporting correlated with propensity to test? I would, so the difficulty with it is, and I mean, I can say anecdotally, and I think a lot of people can, can say it as well, is that I take a lot of lateral flow tests. Fortunately, they've all been negative, but I'd be lying up if I said they've all been reported to the service. So it's certainly used as a proxy. And I think with regards to testing, it's kind of like, if you're, if you're reporting negative tests, then that implies like you were probably asymptomatic and also you it's a voluntary test in the sense that you don't have to report your negative tests but it comes in the sense that you you're doing it just because you're not doing it because like you've developed symptoms or something and so i think of all the tests of all the testing data we have it may be the best one to use as a proxy for how how much are people doing voluntary testing and also with regards to like the ones where like picking up the milder cases of the ones where it hasn't like either like it's an asymptomatic case like infection being picked up or like it's just a very like oh i'm i'm not i'm feeling a bit off today i'll take an lfd those are the ones being picked up there and then to answer the second question of how important was having data at data zone level i would say so one thing that I thought was interesting when doing the models of that deprivation never came up as that like it never came up as that important and my interpretation of that was everything deprivation related was already captured with things such as testing behavior and vaccination uptake and because i had that like at a more finer scale finer scale individual level so broken down to like sex and age Deprivation and disease at the data zone level, so that's like a broad description of around like 500 to 1,000 people. Those broad measures weren't so important. Where they probably were important was, was with regards to things like, let's say, access deprivation, which is typically inversely correlated with other measures of deprivation. But that was a good proxy for saying like how... At, 
like how attached are people to like the rest of society as a proxy for like the number of interactions they're having? Thank you. So um, hopefully that's answered a couple of the questions that have come up in the chat, but perhaps Anthony, in, in the same way as we asked Tristan, if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, not necessarily during your coffee break, but if you wouldn't mind just having a look at the chat and see if there are any questions that came up specifically for you. Sure. Um, but otherwise, we have a 20 minute tea and coffee break now.